Over the last 158 years, Smithville Christian Church has welcomed everyone who transformed by Jesus Christ. And we are a small church, you could say, with a welcoming, very welcoming spirit. A church who loves Jesus and loves His people. And I was reading this week in the Christian Standard, it, it said on the cover, keeping score, and it was about different churches and their attendance. And, and I, I found it interesting, but myself, I really have to confess something. I, I, we keep attendance here, but I don't count. <laughs> and I really don't track the attendance that much. I really don't look at the score, as they say in this, in this magazine. And I guess the reason is, is because I don't really, it's not that I don't care about the numbers, but I just more or less care more about people. Does that make any sense? And I'm not really, it's not a competition. If somebody has more people at their church, I'm happy about that because that means more people in the church. <laughs> we're all on the same team. You know? and we're not really in a competition. So with that being said, though, they, they look at the different numbers and, 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 and all these things. And it's great. And there's some churches doing some wonderful, wonderful things. Yet on Easter Sunday, I was out getting a drink of water after the service, and there's a board there that has our attendance. And if you had asked me what the attendance was last week, I really couldn't tell you. Now, I might be able to tell you who was here because I shook your hand and smiled at me and greeted me with a hug. But I don't know how many of you were here. But on Easter Sunday, I know because I looked up there because Lee told me to look again. He was sitting there. The other elder said, what do you think about that? I said, think about what? He goes, the tenants. And I looked up there and said, 301. And I said, is that some sort of record? He said, yeah, that's, that is. Oh, yeah. Actually, his response was, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I said, okay. So we went to board meeting on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night. And I thought it would be appropriate that, that we had a cake with numbers 301 on top. <laughs> and we celebrate what God is doing. You know, at Smithfield Christian Church, we like to celebrate. Up here, there's 40 roses up here on the communion table this morning. Uh, Lee and Jackie are celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary day. You know, 40 roses. Get out of here and celebrate. They were at the first service. They're gone already. Uh, I, think, I think Leisha's celebrating a birthday, whether she wanted me to get mentioned or not. I just did. Sorry about that. Like, like 21st birthday or so. Yeah. Uh, no, her dad's shaking head, no. No, no. But we like to celebrate. I mean, when the baby is born, what do we do? We celebrate. I and mean, if there's a prayer answered, we celebrate. When a man and a woman uh, take each other's hand in, in holy matrimony, what do we do? We celebrate. When someone gives their life to Jesus Christ and they're married to the waters of baptism, we celebrate. Now, now sometimes these baptisms actually happen in the baptistry. Sometimes they happen in a swimming pool. Sometimes they happen in a hot tub. Maybe they happen in a lake, rivers, even creeks when there's still snow on the ground. <laughs> there's a time of celebration. There's a lot of clapping. There's a lot of joy. There's a lot of singing. There's a lot of hooting. There's even a lot of holler. Yeah, holler. That's the word. Holler. We like to celebrate. And it's good to celebrate because there's a lot of joy express at baptism. So I just want to talk to you about this morning. For in baptism, we celebrate our commitment to Jesus Christ. We celebrate Jesus. We celebrate our commitment to Him. When a man gives his girlfriend a ring and he asks her to marry him, the commitment being pledged, their engagement, is celebrated. I mean, she prances around with that ring on her finger. She walks around like this. In case you didn't know, some, something's different here. <laughs> and whenever her friends see her, they celebrate with her. They, maybe they giggle and they cheer and they hug each other. And sometimes I've even heard them squeal. And they ask questions like, how did he propose? Did he get down on one knee? Where did he do that? Was it a surprise? They celebrate because a commitment has been made. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It is here that we find a man celebrating his commitment to Jesus. 
A commitment he, he makes after hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, this man is an official in charge of the treasury of, of Candace, who was actually the, the queen of the Ethiopians. Uh, scripture tells us that he's a eunuch, which means he's been made impotent, which was very common if you were serving in the queen's court. We don't know the man's name. We refer to him as the Ethiopian eunuch. It's one of my favorite stories of conversion that we read in the Bible. And in this passage, we, we read about an evangelist named Philip. And he's sharing the good news of, about Jesus everywhere he goes. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, we read, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. So he's, he's actually riding in the chariot. He has somebody else driving the chariot. He's reading aloud the book of Isaiah. He's reading aloud the scripture, which was very common in this day. If you could read, oftentimes you read out loud. So here is Philip, and the Spirit tells Philip, go over to that chariot and stay near it. So then Philip ran up to the chariot. I imagine Philip's kind of just jogging along beside. And he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? The man says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invites Philip up to sit with him as he reads. And, and we know what he was reading. He, he, reads, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. Who's he talking about? Who's Isaiah talking about? Talking about Jesus going to the cross, right? As a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Even though this was an injustice, Jesus didn't declare his innocence. He went ahead and he surrendered to the cross to take away our sins. And, and then Philip, he explains this scripture from Isaiah, telling this is a fulfillment of prophecy that just happened. And then we read in verse 34, Philip says that he told the eunuch the good news about Jesus, about how Jesus is the Messiah. He told him that salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. And evidently Philip told him about the, the eunuch about Jesus' words. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved because in verse 36 we read, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said what? He says, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? He gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Notice that when the eunuch believed in the good news of Jesus Christ, he made a commitment to Jesus. He celebrated his commitment by surrendering himself to the waters of baptism. Just as a woman celebrates her commitment, her pledge to be married by surrendering her hand to her boyfriend, so the Christ follower surrenders themselves to the waters of baptism, symbolizing the commitment they've made to Jesus. And it's a celebration. It's a celebration. When Emily was, was nine years old, my daughter Emily, I know I have to pay for sharing this story. When she was nine years old. She makes me do that. Anytime I'm in sure a sermon, it's an hour. This is going up. It's crazy. Me too. Yeah, see, it, it, just one, there's a max payout on this. And Tyson's going to have to front me today, Emily, because I don't have a couple of but when she was nine years old, she, uh, she decided she wanted to follow Jesus. And uh, she wanted to be baptized. She put her faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, and she committed her life to Him. And as I was talking to her about being baptized, I said, Emily, why do you want to be baptized? And he said, because Jesus died for my sins, and I want to follow Him. 
nine years old. And, and we, we see kids eight, nine years old come to that understanding, and, and adults come to that understanding. So the next Sunday, we celebrated her commitment to Jesus Christ, to follow Jesus, and I had the honor of baptizing her. And it was awesome, Emily. It was a great day. And if there's an appropriate word, a time to use the word awesome, baptism is that time, right? It's awesome. I mean, we were excited. Just as the Ethiopian eunuch rejoiced to win on his way, we rejoiced to win on our way that day. And when we were waiting on at the restaurant, we made sure we told our waitress that she had just been baptized. Uh, we were on the way home, and we saw one of our friends and neighbors. He was kind of a heathen, too. We stopped right away. Hey, Emily was baptized today. We told our neighbors, we told our friends, we told our family. Why? Because it was a celebration. It was a celebration of Emily's commitment to Jesus and the cleansing that's found in Jesus. Not just her commitment, but the cleansing that's found in Jesus. This is how we celebrate this. Have you ever noticed that when you witness someone else being baptized, that it touches your heart very, very deeply? And it seems that as we see a baptism, we remember our own baptism in the cleansing that we have in Jesus Christ. It's just this reminder. You know, the most common thing people tell me after they are baptized is, because I feel clean, I feel cleansed, I feel like it's all washed away. Which is very fitting. The scripture tells us that in baptism, though it is something physical, there is something very spiritual that it symbolizes, it symbolizes the washing away of sin. Now understand, there, there's nothing in this water that washes away your sin. If that was the case, I would load this thing up with a super soaker and I'd just spray it. <laughs> like that guy back there needs another squirt, you know? <laughs> I just follow you around, squirt me all the time. It, it's not the water that does the work, it's the cross. You understand this? It's the cross that does the work. But the Bible tells us that we have this feeling of being cleansed, of having a clean conscience, and we're told in 1 Peter 3.21, and that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you not by the removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It's effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Beloved, through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away. His blood washes away our sin. <coughs> By the power of His resurrection, we know without a doubt that we have the power through Christ to be delivered from our sin and live for God. I feel like a lot of people are shortchanging the gospel today. They're talking about sins being washed away, but they're leaving out the part that we can be delivered from our sin and live in it no longer. That's the good news. For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Isn't this good news? The gospel message is Jesus died for our sin, delivered us our sin and raises us to live a new life free from sin. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor Greedy, or the drunkards, or slanders, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This part I love. He says, and that's what some of you were. Key word, were, not are. That's what some of you were. But he says, you've been changed. He says, you were justified. Just as it never happened. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you were washed. You are sanctified. To be sanctified means to be made holy, to be made righteous 
He says, and all this happens in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So church, not just are we free from the consequences of our sin, not just are we free from the agony of hell, but we are free from the bondage of our sin. Now, now I admit, I've not always lived it. I haven't. I'm not going there, but I've not always lived it. I got strayed away from it for many years. <clears throat> I'll tell you this, I came back home to it. And I believe it. And this right here says that I'm washed. And that I'm sanctified. And I'm justified in the name of Jesus Christ. And someone may say to you, you know what? Well, I know about that lie you told. You called yourself a Christian. I know about that lie you told back then. I know about that affair you had. I know about that time that you told the cashier at McDonald's that you were having water so your drink would be free. I watched you go right out that soda fountain and get you a, a, a Coke. I know about it. I know about that abortion. I know about that sinful divorce. I, I know about... That those times you got drunk, uh, I know about that porn that was on your old computer, that X-rated novel that, that you read, I know about that inappropriate texting that you did and the alternative lifestyle you were living. And yes, that is what some of us were. We're not denying that, are we? That's what some of us were. That's the way some of us used to live. That's the sin that some of us did. In fact, all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Not a one of us can say we have. Here's the good news. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you've repented of your sins, and you've been washed with Him in the waters of baptism, the Bible says that you are washed. And we are washed. That that sin is washed away and that we've been sanctified, we've been made holy again, we've made right standing with God and we are justified just as the sin never happened in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That, my friends, is the good news. That, my friends, is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a church, aren't I? I didn't know. I didn't see how anybody agreed with that. <laughs> Just checking. Making sure we weren't one of those that aren't teaching the full truth. See, because I believe that for the power of the gospel, for the power of Jesus Christ, I don't have to remain in bondage of alcohol. Whatever it may be. Talk, slam, gossip. Please, the Bible says, I can grab a hold and claim that new life that's found in Jesus Christ and I can be cleansed, I can be set free. I mean, that, my friends, is the power of the gospel. Amen. Yeah. Oh, God, we <laughs> Haven't convinced you yet. We'll get there. The second Kings. Chapter 5. There's a story of a man named David. <laughs> David was rich. He was a powerful commander of the Syrian army. But underneath his royal robes, he had a terrible skin disease called leprosy. And it burdened him terribly. A housemate of Naaman's actually was grieved over his master's sickness and he told him there's a prophet named Elisha who can, who can cure you. And so Naaman decided, you know what, I'll give it a try. And so he, he loads up a big caravan, he gathers up expensive gifts and ways to impress Elisha. And he goes to Elisha's home and when he gets there, they are, Elisha's told there's this powerful leader out there to see you. He has gifts to honor you with. He's brought his whole entree. Elisha says, I don't need to go out to see him. I'm just go tell him that I know what he needs is tell him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River and he'll be cleansed. 
This assaulted Naaman. I mean, he came and he brought his, some of his army with him. He brought gifts. He, he brought impressive things. And it insulted him. And so he turned to go back home in a huff. Saying, if Washington the river could have saved me, I'd have stayed back home. Because rivers in Syria are much, are much, much cleaner than this dirty old Jordan River. Naaman's servant went to him and he said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman humbled himself and he went down to the Jordan River and he began to dip himself in that river. But after each dip, nothing had changed. At one, at two, at three, at skin, nothing changed. There was no working in the process. He still was a dirty leper. You know, I bet after each dip, when he looked at his skin and saw it was changed, I just guarantee Satan was there whispering in his ear. Look at you, man. You call yourself a leader. Look at you. This is ridiculous. What are you doing out here, Naaman, in this dirty river? Come on, Naaman. You call yourself a commander. You need to get out of this river while you still have some dignity to left, Naaman. Look at you. Watch what you're doing. And you and I both know, Naaman, that after that seventh dip, you're going to be the same leprous loser you were when you got down into this river. And here's what Satan does today, just as he did to Naaman. I believe he says to many today, giving your life to Jesus Christ and be buried with Him and celebrating Him in the waters of baptism isn't going to change anything about your life. You can't change. That's just who you are. You're always going to be jealous. You're always going to curse. You're always going to be a drunk. You'll always be gay. That's just who you are. And here's what you need to know. The saying, you can't change, and that won't change you, is a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. Satan is a liar, and Jesus said, whenever he speaks, he's speaking his native language, and it's all lies. He's a liar. He's the prince of lies. And what Jesus wants to tell you this morning is that you can change. That past sin that you've dealt with, that sin that tempts you, is not your identity. That is not who you are. The church of Jesus Christ finds their identity in Christ. Amen. Not the terrible things, the struggles that we've had. The question is, will you surrender to Jesus and follow Naaman's immediate example? Because Naaman basically shut Satan out, and the Bible says that he went down and he dipped himself seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Brothers and sisters, just as Naaman's flesh was restored and cleansed, we are cleansed from our sin and restored to our God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the Bible says he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new is come. You hear that part? The old is gone. It's buried. It's forgotten. What you do with something when it's dead? Buried. It's done. It's forgotten. The new is come. New has come. I read an article also this week in the same magazine. And it's a pretty good magazine. You gotta pick it up sometime. We put them out there before usually. They go pretty quick though. But it's a pretty good magazine. And they had another interesting article in here. And it was a it was on statistics. It was on baptism ratios. And there's this church in New Hampshire called the Manchester Christian Church. And they had a baptism ratio of 17.7%. And I thought that was exciting. I was trying to figure that out, and then they made it easy. They said that means basically almost 18 for every 100 people in attendance were baptized. And I thought, that's awesome. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good, right? And I was excited about that. This church that we hear all this about how the church is in decline. Nobody wants to hear the truth. Everybody wants to change, change, change. But I was like, no, anyway, I think that's telling me 
the church is alive and well. Amen. So they ask Paul, well, what's our baptism ratio? He's more of a numbers guy than I am. He, I don't know what about. I don't even figure that, you know. But I just went to geometry. We just that with geometry. I don't know. And we said, well, our average attendance in 2014 was 159. Okay. Well, instead of trying to figure out, let's just figure out where, where we kind of line up with Manchester Christian Church because they're at the highest baptism ratio. So we just took their number of 17.7% and we times that by 159. And if you're good in math, you already know what that number is. Came up with 28. The Smithville Christian Church last year we celebrated 28 baptisms. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't share that with you to, for us to practice. I just share with you to celebrate what God's doing in the life of His church. And, and these aren't numbers and these aren't ratios. What these are it is 28 of you who celebrated Jesus Christ in your life, who put your faith in, in what He's done for you on His cross. And it's 28 of you who have been buried into the waters of baptism and claim that that new life that, that's found in Jesus. That's 28 of you who have celebrated something wonderful. I didn't do this in the first service, but I'm not talking about just in 2014, but what is Smithfield Christian Church, the ministry here over the years, some of you have been going here for 60 years. I was just curious, if you're able to, and, and you were baptized, or Smithfield Christian Church has something to do with your salvation, would you stand if you're baptized here, no matter when, sometime along the way, isn't God good? It's not just a Smith little. But I guess I'll leave you guys sit down now. Go ahead and sit. Now, just the Church of Jesus Christ in general has. Has led you to Christ, and you celebrated that in this church. Do you stand? Everybody at this school. I believe in the church, friends. You sit down. Right, just go ahead. Let's all stand. Let's go ahead and stand. <laughs> and do the holy book. Yeah. <laughs> Simon says, I'm I'm going to get serious here for a moment. The church of Jesus Christ is alive, but only they tell you the It's alive right now in 2015. And we are going to celebrate Jesus for all eternity, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Amen. No matter. The gates of hell, the Bible says, Jesus says, will not prevail against the Lord's church. It is the hope. Our hope isn't finding the perfect political leader. That's exactly what some of the people thought when Jesus came. They rejected him because they were looking for the perfect political leader. That's not our hope. Our hope is Jesus. It always has been and it always will be. I love this country. I love it. I love this country. I love the, the flag and the freedom that it stands for. But it is not my hope. My hope is actually in the cross. It's very appropriate that on the, the Christian flag that cross is red because my hope is in that blood that was shed on that cross. And just as men and women have shed their blood for the freedoms we have in this country called America, the greatest country on the face of the earth, our Savior, He, he shed His blood on the cross for our freedom for all eternity. That, that's the good news. That's the good news. Here is 
water. Right there. I told you the good news, just as Philip told the Ethiopian the good news. Here is what. When you celebrate Jesus and be baptized today, the Ethiopian, he said, stop the He saw the water, he said, stop, stop the chariot. We're going to celebrate Jesus. I'm asking you here today. Is there anybody here that needs to celebrate Jesus? We're going to go ahead and sing. Ty says, come on up, start leading us in blessed assurance. Before they start playing, we're just going to get a magic key there. No, start playing. And as we sing, as we sing, we want to celebrate Jesus today. You believe that He died for your sins and you want to be buried with Him in the waters of baptism, to celebrate your commitment to Him, to follow Him. We're going to do that. Everything's already ready. I've already decided if somebody comes forward this morning, I'm just taking my shoes off and I'm getting you. Amen. The way Philip did it, I think. Just hop right in. It's up to you. Put on a rope, whatever you want to put on. We got on there. Because what's most important is that we celebrate Jesus. We're going to go ahead and sing. If you want to celebrate Jesus, you just come to the front. <laughs>